Good people YouTube, I'm the Watch Idiot, and in a few weeks I'm going to be going to two weddings, and that obviously got me thinking about which watch I'm going to wear, and in these instances I'm always thinking about Grand Seiko. And it's a good timing because I haven't really worn or even fully seen my Grand Seiko SBJ387 Kirazor US Limited Edition in a really long time, and my god, it's just, it's even better than I remembered, and it also embodies everything that is incredible about Grand Seiko as a brand. So in this video, I'm gonna get into why I absolutely love this watch, you know, the dial, the 44 GS case, and Grand Seiko in general, because I've owned three relatively different Grand Seikos, a mechanical GMT, a 9F Quartz, and of course, this absolutely insane spring drive. Oh God, just look at this, oh my God. But I'll also get into a few issues that I have with this watch. So uh, yeah. Let's get into it. So first up, we just have to talk about the dial because this is where many, many Grand Seikos absolutely shine, literally and figuratively. And that's very much the case over here because we've got a Kirazuri dial. And instead of me bumbling along trying to explain the dial, I'm just gonna directly read what Grand Seiko has to say about this dial. And quote, inspired by a Japanese painting technique called Kirazuri, true to its translation, sparkling painting, the lustrous dial takes a life of its own commonly found in ukiyo-e paintings to create texture to the background of kabuki actors. The inspired technique adds depth and excitement to the timepieces in movement and light. Yeah, Grand Seiko explains all their dials and inspirations and things like that in such a fantastic way. And yeah, I obviously know that it's very good marketing, but it I feel like there's something to it, like it being a painting technique that's actually a painting technique or on other watches taking inspiration from different areas in Japan or different mountains in Japan. But it is said way too often that dials play with the light and while many dials do play with the light, this and some other Grand Seiko dials just take light play to another level. And here I have some macro photos that I took a long time ago. And not only does the color of the dial change in different lighting conditions, the dial texture can even change depending on the angle of the light, which is just, I, I, it's just a next level stuff. And so between the two aspects, I am just constantly staring at the dial because I never know what I'm gonna see next. And then there's the hands and indices, and this is what made me fall in love with Grand Seiko in the first place. Because when I got my first Grand Seiko, the SBGM221, I had never seen a Grand Seiko in person. And when I saw the way that the hands and indices were polished in such an otherworldly perfect way in person, I just bought it immediately. They look so perfect and actually the indices almost look like diamond indices. It's bizarre. And then of course the hands look razor sharp, perfectly polished as well. And the best part of having these flat polished surfaces is that you can see a perfect mirror reflection of other things in the room or in the world. And that will simply never get old for me. To this day, I have never experienced anything like the perfectly flat Zoratsu polish of Grand Seiko. And if you haven't seen one of these in person, please find an AD and just go and experience this. And while this is connected to the movement, which I'll get into later, watching the seconds hand glide over the dial instead of making little jumps ahead, like on a mechanical watch, is mesmerizing and weirdly peaceful and I just can't stop looking at it. Oh, and a controversial take here. I really like the power reserve on the dial and I find it to be extremely useful, but I won't get into all the reasons for both things here just because there's so much more to talk about in this video. So everything I say here will go for any Grand Seiko with a 44 GS case and also every other Grand Seiko case to a certain degree because the standard is extremely high on all Grand Seikos. My favorite Grand Seiko case design is the 44 GS undoubtedly because you get these gigantic flat surfaces on the tops of the lugs where you can take in the glories of the Zarazu polishing more than on any other Grand Seiko case and like the hands and indices 
sees. The polishing is on another level because you can see perfect mirror reflections off of it. And I'm just in awe whenever I see this because it's something I've never experienced on any other Grand Seiko, let alone any other watch. In pretty much every other video, I always say that I love seeing as many brush surfaces as possible, you know, short of a, you know, polished bevel or something like that. But with Grand Seiko, it's the exact opposite. I want as many polished surfaces as possible and as many flat polished surfaces as possible. But then there's the shape of the 44 GS case and it's right up my alley as well because of the sharp angular lines and the way that it has a somewhat muscular look while also being super clean and elegant. And the fact that it was the first case design based on the grammar of design principles laid out by Taro Tanaka in 1962 makes it that much better. And yeah, just Google the grammar of design principles later on if you want. But given how unbelievably perfect the case polishing is, it heightens my babying tendencies because I don't want to intensely scratch up any of these perfect flat polished surfaces in a way that would stop me from staring at it into oblivion or just 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 messing up the just the perfection of it all and on top of that kind of as a side note this has gone up in value quite a bit and that further makes me want to be careful to the point that I haven't worn it in ages so maybe it's time to sell and buy a Grand Seiko that I won't feel as precious about so yeah it's a little bit of an interesting conundrum I'm in uh, because at the moment whenever I'm wearing it it's wearing me I'm not wearing it Next up is the spring drive movement and yeah, my God, this is a special movement because people sometimes wrongly say that this is just a quartz, but it isn't. But also at the same time, it can't be considered a mechanical watch either. Spring drive really is just its own thing. So there are articles out there that get deep into the details, which are absolutely fascinating. But basically in 1977, Yoshikazu Akahane had the idea to make a mechanical watch accurate by having it regulated by some sort of electronic device like in quartz watches. This was unbelievably difficult because the watch on its own with just a mainspring had to power an integrated circuit that was normally powered by a battery on quartz watches. So then 28 years and more than 500 prototypes later, the spring drive came to be. And in short, the way it works is mostly like any mechanical automatic watch, you know, with a rotor, mainspring, and a gear train leading up to the escapement. But instead of the escapement, we have the tri-synchro regulator and the tri is referring to the different types of power used. In this case, it's mechanical, electric, and electromagnetic power. So yeah, this can be its own video series, pretty much just talking about the spring drive. And so yeah, I'll restrain myself a little bit over here. So in short, the way that the tri regulator works is by having the mainspring power a tiny spinning rotor really fast next to a set of copper coils, which in turn generates power through electricity to run an electrical integrated circuit where the quartz oscillator is. And that quartz oscillator then regulates the timekeeping by slowing the aforementioned tiny spinning rotor down to the right speed by applying a braking force using magnets. And that is what gives us the quartz accuracy in a mechanical watch. Like, like I have no words to describe how special this is because in my opinion, there hasn't been any developments in the watch world like the spring drive movement ever since the spring drive movement. This is a mechanical watch that I can wear every day without the need to wind it additionally, with no batteries to change, that is accurate to my experience to like one to two seconds a week and less than 10 seconds gained in a month. Like in a month, all this just truly boggles my mind and all of this is in such a beautiful and wearable package. And the really awesome thing is that on your wrist, you can actually experience the specialness of the spring drive movement because the rotor just spins constantly the seconds hand as a result, just glides over the dial instead of moving forward in tiny little steps on a mechanical watch, which is a result of the escapement tick tocking forward and backwards. And just watching the seconds hand glide over the dial, like I mentioned before, is hypnotic and like so many other things it's unlike anything that i've experienced before so yeah i mean whew. 
So yeah, there you have it. I can go on for hours about this watch and about Grand Seiko, but you know, this was just, I guess, a little bit of a, a moose-bouche of the glories of Grand Seiko. So yeah, if you enjoyed the video, go ahead and let YouTube know that you liked it by liking and hitting the subscribe button. And until the next video, good day.